So today we're honored to present Miércoles del Grito Siete, our seventh week of resilience, innovation, and community engagement by international Latinx professionals in contemporary dance. Today we have Decolonizing the Performing Body, Somatics and choreo Choreographic Inquiry. The first half will be led by Rosana Barragan, offering a lecture demonstration on decolonizing the field of somatics. And she will lead us all in a somatic exercise based in her somatic practices of body-mind centering and dynamic embodiment to provide us with a moment of self-care and compassion to help manage stress and anxiety at this time. The second half of our program today will be led by Catherine Marie Davalos presenting Moving, Feeling, Generating, a site for Chicanx re resistance, sharing vi video excerpts in a chronology of her choreography for the last 25 years. And now we introduce Rosana Barragan, a dance artist and educator from Colombia and currently a tenure track faculty at, of dance at St. Mary's College of California. She has a graduate degree in dance studies from the Laban Center Cent City University in London. She is a certified body mind centering teacher and registered through the International Somatic Movement Education and Therapy Association as a dynamic embodiment instructor. Rosana is an advocate of dance and, and somatics on the West Coast and owns a dance school for children, which provides a method incorporated into schools throughout San Francisco. Her choreographic work has been awarded internationally for its success at embracing social awareness. Welcome, Rosana. Bienvenida. Hola a todos. Gracias, Liz, Arturo, Andreina. Thank you. Thank you, everyone involved with putting flag together. I am thrilled to be here with so many of you, 29 participants, and I guess many more on Facebook Live. So thank you everyone of you for joining us this afternoon as my colleague Kathy Davalos and I present our perspective on the decolonization of dance. I must begin by saying that what I'm about to share with you is just my view based on my interpretation and my own embodied explorations of different theories, views, and approaches that come from individuals who are deeply invested in the difficult task of inquiry that brings us all together this afternoon. What is truly decolonization? What does it mean in the specific context of dance and performance? What is our role as a community who embody privilege at many levels to collectively move forward and attack the layers that, uh, that we have inherited from the vast impact of colonization. I want to acknowledge that I only have one view, but we're here together and this work must be done by all of us together. So we, have maybe 40 or 50 or more than uh, three or four decades of views. And I respect everyone's wisdom, everyone's history and everyone's perspectives. Thank you everyone for being here. The land acknowledgement that we just heard from uh, Arturo and that flag presents at the very beginning of each session covers everything. It's full of richness, of rich inclusions. I just want to acknowledge one element that in my opinion is perhaps missing. And that element has to do with acknowledging slavery. And this element uh, comes from my conversations with the Dance Studies Association and the Dismantling White Supremacy in Dance Studies Working Group that I belong to. In that working group, we consider the addition of this statement as a very important one. And it refers to the acknowledgement of the labor of enslaved African people who built this country's economy and shaped its culture. 
we acknowledge the land where we are at right now. We just did that and some of you shared that in the chat. And I want to now invite you to check in with your bodies, like Liz was saying earlier, to continue during this hour and a half that we're together to really check in with our bodies. And let's visit the place where you were born. So any memory that you have of your own birth, please welcome it right now. And we're going to take a moment to acknowledge the land where your body was born and the original peoples of that land. And I want to share with you this resource. I'm going to put it in the chat for everyone. So you can play with that map. And if you type even a small town in the middle of the Andes Mountains in Latin America, in South America, you <laughs> will be able to find um, who lived in that land. So, and if you can find that right now and type in the name of the town where you were born and you can, um, you, that would be lovely to have in the chat. So we can all together do a big acknowledgement of that land where you were born and who that land uh, belonged to and who it was taken away from. So I'm standing right now in the territory of the Ohlone Ramaytush, original peoples of the San Francisco Peninsula. And my mother gave birth to me in the same land where she gave birth to my siblings and in the same land where my grandmother gave birth to her and the same land where my great grandmother gave birth to my grandmother. The land of the Guane indigenous people of the Northeast of Colombia. So as you bring to your own consciousness and to our collective consciousness, the land where you were born and the land of your ancestors, I want to invite you to allow your memory to awaken an image of nature, the nature of your land. So for example, my Guane people's land is characterized by the moss that hangs extensively from giant trees and the bright red color of the soil. So I invite you right now to keep an image of nature, of one aspect of nature from your native land and allow that to live in your body. And I now want to take a quiet moment to also acknowledge our privilege at all levels, at all levels possible our privilege in terms of education, economic means, having a job, health, having time to be here, a place where we live, food, drinkable water, a computer, Wi-Fi, having access and knowing how to access Zoom and Facebook Live. And I now want to begin with honoring my sources that have influenced me, especially in the last few months, so I could go deeper with my inquiry of what decolonization means to me and to my dancing body. We usually have the list of sources or the works cited page or the bibliography at the end of a paper or at the end of a presentation. For me, it is extremely important to put it right in the front to refer to it at the very beginning. So we begin by acknowledging where our information is coming from. And I'm going to share the screen with you all so I can really honor the sources of the information that I want to share with you today. So these are the individuals that offered me inspiration to make connections, to frame my inquiry and to draw interpretations. By calling their names and honoring their work, I feel them present with me right now as I speak and share with you today. This work can only be done, as I just said, in community with each other. So I feel the company of my sources of inspiration right now. Brigitte Baptiste is a Colombian landscape ecologist and expert on environmental issues and biodiversity, ex-director of the Humboldt Biological Resources Research Institute in Colombia and is currently the provost of EAN University in Bogota. A quote from Brigitte Batiste, 
the Awa and Embera indigenous peoples of the Pacific coast of Colombia believe that they're descendants of the lianas, of the roots that grow from the epiphyte, from the orchids that grow in the trees. They develop their identities from the way that they relate to the animals and the plants. They develop hybrid identities. Their identities are completely inseparable from the natural environment. Diana Uribe is a Colombian historian, well known in Colombia for her podcast and all of her radio programs on the history of the world. And you can find those at dianauribe.fm. I'm particularly moved by one of her three episodes on women in Latin America, where Diana refers to Silvia Rivera Cusicanqui, a Bolivian feminist, sociologist, historian, and subaltern and theorist who draws upon anarchist theory, as well as Quechua and Aymara cosmologies. Rulan Tangen, founding director and choreographer of Dancing Earth, indigenous contemporary dance creations. Tangen refers to her work with the following statement. In the dream visioning that has become Dancing Earth, from the very beginning, I have always defined indigenous beyond, beyond borders inclusive of enrolled Native Americans, as well as people who are global indigenous, mixed ethnicity, including indigenous relocated from original homelands, non-federally recognized or specific tribal lineage obscured due to colonization, but upheld through oral history and other variants to create an artistic culture of belonging that is rooted in our human relationship with the earth and cosmos including other peoples and all living beings in a vision for balance. In these Dancing Earth eco-cultural practice, Roland Tangen's, Tangen says, I facilitate paths for exchange of cultural and eco-sustainability knowledge by practitioners and within the group, I often guide, I'm often guided by cultural elders. In my role with Dancing Earth as director and choreographer, I have facilitated a shared creative cultural process rather than imposed any one cultural perspective. My hope and intention is that this seeds empowerment, self-knowledge, and a deep relation to the collective and leadership based on the greater whole. Mariko Tanabe, a body mind centering practitioner, teacher, and director of the BMC licensed program in Montreal, Canada and her own experience shared with me from her ancestral lineage healing work with Dr. Daniel Four and the family constellation work of Bert Hellinger. In addition to Mariko Tanabe, I must honor the influence and inspiration received from my other teachers that have accompanied me in my journey as a somatic movement practitioner. Bonnie Bainbridge Cohen, Martha Eddy, and my early awakening toward finding my own embodied understanding of social justice at Moving On Center with Carol Swan, who's here with us today. And my last source um, of inspiration um, is the Dismantling White Supremacy in Dance Studies Working Group from the Dance Studies Association, and particularly the leadership presence and work of the group members Takia Nor Amen and Niyama McCarthy Brown. And here is my full list of sources. And here it ends. I'm gonna stop sharing the screen with you all. So as I said, it's, it's very important for me to mention my sources at the very beginning and to honor them and to feel that they're with me in this conversation with you all. So thank you all of these individuals who I just mentioned and thank you those who influence them and inspire them, the teachers of them and the teachers of their teachers and so on. I grew up in the land of the Guane natives in Colombia, like I said earlier, my mother, an expert in both flamenco dance and Colombian folklore from our specific land in the northeast of Colombia. She was an expert in dances from pre and post colonial times, meaning those that belong to the indigenous traditions as well as those that came with the Spanish traditions. I must acknowledge right now my shame 
around my own ignorance when it comes to my native dances of my land. But my mother was an expert in them. It was my birthright to stay connected to what I had inherited in terms of how my ancestors moved and danced and all the dance traditions embraced by my people before me. But I instead trained in Russian ballet following the Vaganova strict method from the age of seven until the age of 18. In the 1980s, all the girls my age wanted to wear Nike shoes, go to the shopping malls and eat fast food, especially if that was at the very first McDonald's open in Colombia in the 1980s or at Pizza Hut. And of course, listen to Madonna and Michael Jackson. I trained in American Luigi jazz dance that came to my city from Venezuela, which was a very wealthy country then, and from where many products coming from overseas used to enter Colombia. When it was time for me to go to college, I encountered modern dance, and it was Martha Graham. I did Graham, later Limon, and much later, I went to specialize even more on and only on the Western framework to view and understand Western dance. I embodied this entirely Eurocentric view at the Institute created by Rudolf Laban in England in the mid 20th century. When I went there in the year 2000, it was called the Laban Center, and now it is called the Trinity Conservatory of Music and Dance. I must pause right now to go more in depth to recognize that as a Latin American, I'm not only a mestiza of mixed race, indigenous and Spanish. And like perhaps many who are here and have had a similar history can relate. My indigenous side was and continues to be a shame for part of my family and for society. So the more you could delete your indigenous layers, the better, the better so you could be accepted in society. That's how I grew up. So not only this factor of attempting to erase all indigenous traces in my body, in our body is problematic. Colonization in Latin America, like in many other countries in the world, or in the Americas, I should say, didn't stop with the Spanish leaving the continent. One of the founding fathers and fifth president of the United States, James Monroe, came up with the Monroe Doctrine in 1823. And this is not part of my history. This is part of US history. But what I'm about to say is 100% part of my history. So yes, the doctrine was saying that the US would not tolerate further colonization. It called for no more European intervention in the Americas but it was also used to justify US imperialism in the Western hemisphere. The famous statement from the Monroe Doctrine, America for the Americans has received multiple interpretations, including the fact that it should be read as Americas, the entire continent that includes Central America, the Caribbean and South America from Alaska all the way to Patagonia, the Americas for the Americans. So I must acknowledge where I'm coming from, a very heavy framework, framework of not only European colonization, but also of the United States imperialism in Latin America. And although this is very important to mention, it is not the purpose of my sharing today. So let me return to my questions. What are my questions? What is my responsibility to myself and my own agency to claim my birthright to revisit what truly belongs to me and what truly has belonged to my ancestors? Where do I begin to unpack and peel the layers of my colonized body? How do I examine myself in this regard? If at the same time, I continue to see my young students, ages 17, 18, who are just beginning their college journey, first year, fresh, graduated, they just graduated from high school and they come to my somatic fundamentals class this semester and tell me that they have always received the following instruction, which is the only right way 
to be in the body. Pull your stomach in, tuck your pelvis in, tighten your buttocks, keep your spine straight, and now dance. And I'm saying this not because my students refer to this 20 or 30 years ago. No, they said this to me 20 days ago, last month in September. So we continue to look at the ideal aesthetic of the dancing body following the ideal body as revealed from ancient Greek culture. And that later became the norm for the elite form of ballet, which specific values and codes come from the aristocratic way of relating to people at the court during the Renaissance period of absolute monarchy. This is perhaps what we read in most dance history books and what we have embodied if we have had ballet as part of our dance, dance training. Furthermore, the questioning of the word technique deserves attention. This question is raised by dance scholar, Dr. Takiya Nor Amin in the article Beyond Hierarchy, Reimagining African Diaspora Dance in Higher Education Curricula. She writes, I use movement vocabularies, approaches to movement or dance forms in place of the more commonly used term technique and or style. Technique has been used to distinguish and prioritize European dance forms and aesthetic approaches. Let's now travel south to South America, to the country of Bolivia. So we can see the view of de on, the view on decolonization from Bolivian historian Silvia Rivera Cusicanqui. When Colombian historian Diana Uribe refers to Silvia Rivera, she reminds us that Bolivia has a very, very old history. And Diana Uribe says, the new world, the Americas, was new for the Europeans when they found this enormous piece of land on earth, but it was not new to us. 62% of the population in Bolivia is indigenous. Although Bolivia didn't officially recognize this until 2009, that they have ethnic diversity and that they have 38 official languages, one of the countries in the world with most languages. Diana Uribe states that in Latin America, we became independent from the Spanish empire and emerged as a continent in that act but we did not decolonize ourselves. In other words, we continue to look at each other with the eyes with which they looked at us. We continue to classify ourselves with the eyes with which they classified us. And we continue to consider words like Indian and insult. And we continue to consider European ancestry as the only valid one. And we continue to consider the Afro world as an invisible, invisible world. And that way of looking at us, Diana Uribe says, is not how we are, but how they left us seen. So decolonizing means to start to look from the inside, looking at ourselves from our diversity, from the indigenous world, from the African world, and not only from the European world. We're not going to say no to the European world, she says, but the explanation from the European world would be almost impossible to understand if only that was the only story that we hear. Even this is seen, Diana Uribe says, in our last names in Latin America. From the fifth or sixth last name back, there is a gap because our last names in Latin America have a fundamentally Spanish reference. Diana Uribe, when referring to Silvia Rivera, says that Rivera places emphasis on the idea that indigenous peoples have their own history, even if it is not recorded in writing, and their philosophical systems are as valid as the legacies of the West. Silvia studies Quechua and Aymara cosmologies and refers to the Aymara concept of Chitsi, and I'm going to put it in the chat for you all. So the Aymara concept of Chitsi means stain. And 
She says, Silvia Rivera, we're mestizos, but we have a strong Indian stain in our souls. Chitsi is a word with multiple connotations, but in, the, in this context, it is offered as a metaphor and it brings in the idea of a visual image where there is a juxtaposition of small color, color dots where white and black are opposed and juxtaposed and that produces an effect of many degrees of gray, of the color gray. In Sylvia's words, Chixi embodies an Andean from the Andes in South America, gesture to work with the contradiction as a way of moving between opposite worlds. For instance, the snake is not only Chixi for being spotted but also for being an Aymara mythical animal who belongs to both the world above and the world below. It is both masculine and feminine. It is both rain and a vein of metal. It is symbolized both as a lightning striking from a great height and as a subterranean force. When Rivera is asked if she's indigenous and non-indigenous at the same time, her response is yes, of course. Being indigenous is a becoming. It is not an identity. It is a search. Chitsi proposes that things are and are not the same way at the same time. Diana Uribe compares the idea of Chitsi to Chinese Tao based on the union of opposites in yin and yang in synchronicity. And in Aristotle's, Aristotle's logic, which is the basis for Western thought, there is a thing that is actually the opposite called the principle of non-contradiction. And that is that things cannot be and not be in the same way and at the same time. And on that idea, on that idea of the principle of non-contradiction is where our entire we received the entire frame, framework for our, our Western thought. So following Chiitsi, we're not specifically Afro, nor specifically Indian, nor specifically European, but at the same time, we're Afro, indigenous and European. And Diana Oribe and uh, Silvia Rivera further explain, but we're not them in a sense that can be isolated like the yolk from the egg white. We are a miscegenation, a mestizaje, or a conjunction in the same way of the Chiitsi points that can be white, black, gray, and that are juxtaposed, grouped in different ways and with different intensities. That is the blend of what it means to be Latin American. And I'm just gonna read uh, a couple more statements from Silvia Rivera. She says the decolonial is a fashion, the post-colonial a desire and the anti-colonial a struggle. It is about decolonizing self-consciousness, overcoming Western ocular centrism and shifting our gaze. So it is part of a full experience that is organic and that also involves the other senses. So this is not a work that must be done from the intellect. This is a work that must be organic and that must involve the other senses such as smell, smell or touch. In other words, it is about reintegrating the guess. So we now turn it, turn the view towards the body. And with this idea of what it is to turn the view towards the body, because in my opinion, and following all of these sources of inspiration that I just um, shared with you, the work must start with the body, with our living bodies, with our somas. So with this, I want to invite you, wherever you are, if you're sitting, standing, um, I just want you to start just touching your body anywhere where it feels right. And I just want to clarify that when Liz um, was introducing me, Liz mentioned that I was um, certified in body mind centering. And I just need to clarify that I am not. I am a certified body mind dancing teacher. And body mind dancing is a branch that comes from dynamic embodiment. 
a somatic movement system recognized by ISMETA, the International Somatic Movement Education and Therapy Association. So I am a registered somatic movement educator through ISMETA, and I'm also a body mind dancing teacher. So we're just like really touching our body right now. And I'm gonna ask you to begin with just like really relating to your skin, like really just touching your skin right now. Only skin, just to awaken sensation right now, brushing any type of pinching. If folks want to turn on your cameras so that we can all participate in it, that would be amazing. If you want to close your eyes, please do so. And I'm going to take you through an experience that has some body-mind centering elements and also some elements from um, the ancestral he healing lineage, the, the ancestral lineage healing work that um, that Mariko Tanabe, BMC, body mind centering professional, has shared with me. So, from the skin, I want to ask you to go a little deeper to the muscle, any body part. And from there, we're going to now try to connect with our heart structure, with our bones. And let's really try to separate the layer of the skin, then the layer of muscular tissue, to then really find the heart structure, the bone. And from the bone, I'm going to ask you to visualize and feel at the same time, the most internal part, part of your bone, the bone marrow. And as you do this, I'm gonna ask you to choose one particular bone of your body and begin to move from that place. And I'm gonna ask you to begin to move from that place using curves and using spirals. And really stay, try to stay, I invite you all in that spongy tissue inside the bones in the body, the bone marrow, where the cells are formed. Bone marrow makes more than 200 billion new blood cells every day. And as you continue to move, and you may transfer to another bone in your body, but again, try to really stay in that deep, deep spongy tissue of the bone marrow. And as you continue to be there and move in curves and spirals, it can help if you close your eyes, if you want to. It's really your choice. But please continue to go with these spirals. And I'm gonna ask you to choose one line to try to visit your ancestors right now. Either you're, and I want to acknowledge that each of us have our unique histories based on our caregivers and who gave birth to us. But let's try to choose one of the two lines, either the line of your mother or the line of your father. And as you continue to move, and again, and if at any point you need to find stillness, please do so. Try to go a little one generation back from one of the two lines, either your mother or your father. 
or again, I want to respect whatever your history is in regards to your biological parents. And go one layer back to your grandparents, to your great grandparents. You may close your eyes if you haven't yet. You may find stillness if you want to. And invite your body to go even farther back and to recognize, allow your body to really see things that perhaps you don't know. Your cognitive brain doesn't know, but your body knows. And your bone marrow knows and your cells know. And see if you can really allow yourselves to go even farther back and farther back and even imagine you and your ancestors in pre-colonial times, in pre-Christian times. And what do you feel right now? And ask if at this time where you're at with your ancestors, ask how they danced, how they moved. And invite yourself to move with them. Just continue with your dance, whatever that dance is. Just notice what you're sensing, what you're feeling. For me, when I have had the opportunity to go with this experience, I have found innocence in my body and this term innocence is very meaningful for me when I'm trying to peel the layers and understand what decolonization means in my body in my moving body in my dancing body and slowly Touching your body again, touching your bones, connecting with your bone marrow again. We're different now than five minutes ago when we began this experience. If you had your eyes closed, go ahead and open them. And with this, I would like to end and end with the idea that comes from body mind centering, the idea of the shadow and how we have all our ancestral knowledge in the shadow and shadow in body mind centering refers to all the potential that we have and that has not manifested yet. And let's say that our ancestors are present in our shadow most of the times and our innocent body is in the shadow. And my invitation is for us to reverse it and the layers that we have due to colonization, I offer that we let them be in the shadow. So our true embodiment nourished by our ancestry comes to the forefront. And with that, I really want to pass the baton to my friend and colleague, Kathy Davalos, who I admire because 
in Kathy's work, I see her ancestors living. Kathy, it's your turn now. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, Rosanna. I'm going to introduce Kathy uh, just briefly before she jumps in. Thank you. That was a beautiful presentation. <clears throat> and um, sorry for the misunderstanding about body mind centering. <laughs> I think I actually put a note that I needed to ask you about that. So we didn't get to it. Uh, that's how it goes, but thank you for the clarification. And that was really a lot of um, nourishing resource. Thank you. So Kathy, uh, she will be producing Moving Feeling Generating, a site for Chicanex resistance, sharing video excerpts in a chronology of her choreography for the last 25 years, followed by a Q&A with the audience. Catherine Marie Davalos is a Chicana choreographer whose work emerges from her Mexican voice and the constant rediscovery of identity. Davalos makes dances that question heteronormativity using a feminist Latina and Chicana perspective. She pioneered the Department of Dance at St. Mary's College of California, which includes a traditional undergraduate program for young dancers, an undergraduate program for professional dancers known as LEAP, and a graduate division, which offers an MFA in dance creative practice and in dance design and production. That's four programs that she pioneered, which is amazing. Uh, she's a core FLAC organizer and has featured her choreography in FLAC since its inception. And we welcome you, Kathy. Bienvenida. Yay. Well, thank you, Liz. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to switch to my screen sharing right now so that we can get started on what I want to work with you on. And... As Liz mentioned, go ahead, computer, there we go. Moving, feeling, and generating a site for Chicana resistance. My background, this is a, a photo of my parents. Uh, they met at age 13. This is probably when they're 16 years old in high school. I come from a first generation Mexican family on my father's side. My grandmother, Refugio Davalos, my nana, came to this country at the age of three by way of the Texas border. And on the Italian side, my mother is second generation. Her parents were born in Ohio and my great grandparents were born in Italy. I was born in Los Angeles like my father. I'm the second daughter between two sisters with a brother at the end. I come from an educated middle-class family. Both of my parents attended graduate school. My mother has a PhD in public, sorry, my father has a PhD in public administration and my mother was a high school English teacher and a librarian. My older sister, Deanna, is a social worker and my younger sister is Dr. Karen Mary Davalos, renowned Chicana scholar. My brother, David, practices ancestral medicine. This is a photo of my father. We were not allowed to speak Spanish in the home due to the racism my father received as a young child entering school. We were taught to assimilate. But the United Farm Workers poster hung in our dining room, sorry, and we grew up without grapes and lettuce boycotting produce as the UFW demanded. Finding my choreographic voice was uh, something asked of me when I was in graduate school I was making dances and my mentor, Trincha Shapley said, you're making dances like me. And while I'm honored, you're not a white woman. What do you want to say? And I wasn't sure, I wasn't sure at all. So um, I went home and I wrote this. It's a poem called With Jade in Mouth. And later it became a, a solo for myself. I never learned to speak Spanish, but I still feel very Mexican. And my soul is very brown. 
I am the height of an Aztec woman, Chicana, Latina, Mexicana. What are you? I'm Italian and Mexican. I'm Italian and Mexican. I'm Mexican and Italian. I no longer hide or mumble. My soul is very brown and so is my skin. My grandmother used to speak to me in Spanish when she was angry with me or when she used to sing to me on my birthday. I was with her when she died. Now I sleep in her bedroom. I never learned to speak Spanish until now. And then normally in the work, someone sings the, the birthday song to me. <laughs> We're not going to do that today. I won't make one of you sing. So then I wrote this. I am a Chicana choreographer. My work emerges from my Mexican voice using a feminist, Latina, and Chicana perspective. My dances uncover the coalescence and contradictions of identity, question heteronormativity and patriarchy, and challenge the current political climate of hatred, fear, and violence toward the other. Growing up in California with brown skin rendered me invisible at times and the target of hatred and oppression at other times. This left marks on me. But more importantly, my blood lineage also informs my choreographic process. My ancestors are revealed in my work. In 1996, I created this piece called Return after the death of my uncle, and it has become my signature work. When we were sitting in the hall after my uncle's funeral, my cousins played the song Volver, Volver, performed by Los Lobos, and my other cousin said, he made a joke that this was the national anthem for the Mexicans in East LA. And later I went to the studio and played the music and in 15 minutes created this dance. And as I um, audition for festivals or I'm invited to be performing in other venues, almost everyone asks me or one of my dancers to perform this work. So imagine if you will, the dancer facing the large metal wall or border that separates California and Mexico. And we are facing that border together as we watch this piece.
as a signature work or a place that helped me find my voice was a piece called Dobles. And this work celebrated the acceptance of my Mexican self or my Mexican body. And the work has a double meaning as the title implies. Dobles is in the fold or the crease of your pants or duplicity. So on the surface, the dance appears as a romantic duet. And throughout the duet, I keep him at a distance. And then he moves into indigenous movement. And finally, I embrace him. And the metaphor is that he represents my Mexican self. So here's an excerpt from Dobles, danced by me and Rogelio Lopez. called Border Spaces and Brown-Eyed Girls. And I created that work in 1995 as a personal investigation of identity, armed with my own Chicana, po ar yeah, armed with my own poetry and newly published Chicana theory, I began to unpack what it meant to be brown. I used real life experience as I recorded the events that made me realize I was treated differently. When I returned to the work in 2019, I was struck by the relevancy of it. We are still a marginalized community. In Yamevoy, a section created for the 2019 version, Borders, Spaces, and Brown Eyes, the dancers explore migration. In the 2019, ver 2019 version, you'll see my dancers, Feli Casares, Catalina O'Connor, Rogelio Lopez, Edgar Mendes, and Haley Yaffe. And all of these dancers, with the exception of Rogelio Lopez, were my students at one time, graduating from St. Mary's College.
Revolutionary War, which was the impetus for my family to immigrate to the United States. Later, I wrote this um, after 25 years of being a choreographer with the Davalos Dance Company. The mission of the Davalos Dance Company is to serve the Latina, Latino, Latinx community by making dances that speak from a marginalized voice while moving from an indigenous movement aesthetic to a contemporary somatic practice. I am interested in collaboration and seek artists who have an investment in the same somatic and political arena. My company consists of non-conforming bodies, marginalized races, and gender fluid and queer identities. Our intersectionality informs our work. And I chose this photo of Shauna Vela, one of the first dancers in my company that I met 21 years ago at St. Mary's College. Shauna has been my muse for many years. Finally, our history informs us. I seek to uncover original subject matter and a configuration of design that provides my movement invention. I balance my activism with my artistry and share what it's like to be brown in the 21st century. Thank you. Bravo. Beautiful. I and now the two of you have a, would you like to go straight into Q and A or would you, do, you, do the two of you wanna chat a bit? I think we can go straight into Q and A. Um, any, with audience questions? Okay, sounds good. Um, let's get back to your, can't see you now. <laughs> um, <laughs> I have a lot of questions and I know the audience does too, but I wanted to uh, just squeeze in one question that I have for you, Kathy, you know what it is. Um, <laughs> I just, you know, you being the director of dance at St. Mary's College for all these years um, and how many years exactly? 24. 24 years, you've, you know, educated hundreds of, of dance professionals, educators, choreographers. Um, and I just wanted to, and you being a woman of color, Chicanx, leading this program, we know that diversity and equity cannot happen without diverse leadership. And so you being a resource there, I'm, I'm wondering if you could speak to how the culture there that you've worked to cultivate is different um, and unique. And if you could describe the, the leadership, the, the faculty, the students demographically or, or a style or sort of um, what is, yeah, your culture that you're working to create there and, and how is it kind of unique to your style? Sure. Arturo, will you highlight my other camera? Absolutely, give me just a second. Uh, where are you? <laughs> Am I? 
So what happened to my other camera? Mm -hmm. I guess we'll just use this one. I don't there you know. Go. This one's not a very good angle. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Anyway, um, so when I got to St. Mary's, one of the things that we were we, me, I guess, managing was the, the low numbers of dancers in the program. And then um, the fact that I come from a non-traditional track into dance, which is to start at a, an older age and to not be trained in ballet. And one of the things that I knew that I wanted to do was create a non-competitive atmosphere um, Liz and I went to the same program. We had to audition for every class, every level to be moved up. We, um, and then that was posted on a wall so everyone could see who went up and who didn't. And um, at one point we were also weighed to, for um, probation. Like if you, I, I remember being on weight probation at one time as well. And uh, I think I weighed about 98 pounds at the time. So I'm not quite sure what they thought I was supposed to do. But anyway, um, so I, when I started the program at St. Mary's, I knew that I wanted something different from that. And, and I knew that I needed people around me that had like-minded um, philosophy around teaching dance. So uh, I met Dana Lawton first in a rehearsal and she, like me, was told she should not be dancing. She was too old to start and she was too short. I was told I was too short, too brown, and, and like I said, overweight to be a dancer. And um, then we met Rosanna and Ja after that. And um, Ja Wu is from China and has a similar experience around not being the quite uh, Western ideal to be a dancer in China. And uh, Rosanna coming from a very different practice, as you heard, and being able to teach anything that we uh, asked her to do, including Latin dance, ballet, modern. And so um, Rosanna joined us. And then I looked at my, my, the people in my world were non-dominant culture. Dana was the only one. And that's when I realized that we had something different. And we continue to be a, a mostly... Um, diverse faculty. Nice. Thank you. And your students reflect a diverse student body too, I, from what I, it appeared. Mostly, I mean, St. Mary started as a very much um, non-diverse campus when I got there. And, and the college has worked very hard to change that picture. And so today it's much more diverse and we are what's called a Hispanic serving institution. Awesome. Interesting. Thank you. Well, they've got the right person in charge. <laughs> people. Plural. I think, okay. that, yeah, exactly. People. It's a collective. Um, the dance program mm -hmm. is not fabulous because of me. It's fabulous because of us and our students. I yes. include them in that. Also a um, decolonial approach. Thank you. <laughs> that collective. So if anyone has any other questions for Rosanna or Kathy, you can just open up your uh, screen, unmute yourself and ask, or you can type it in the chat and I can read it for you. Um, either way, whatever you prefer, we'll try to get to at least three questions before we end. I see a question in the chat coming from my- Yeah, by the end. Yeah. Would you like to ask, uh, ask the question yourself, Diana? Okay. Hi. Hi, Diana. I'm so happy to be like uh, participating in this event. It was so inspiring, both of your um, participations, uh, Rosanna, your um, somatic leading was so deep. I was just like, very very moved by you know how much is there you know to find you know and these like layers layers that we we can only discover through the body so it was really really moving thanks so much and um yeah <laughs> i work with my 
my breastbone, in fact, and that the breastbone, you know, the sternum has a lot of like blood cells, <laughs> spongy, spongy bones. So, um, yeah, thanks so much. I was just wondering, how do you see this search for decolonization and our Afro-Indigenous root coming in Latin America? I, I see that it's, there is a lot happening here in the U.S., you know, in the Latino community, in the somatic dance community. You know, there is, there is like more awareness about that, I would say. But I was just wondering, like, from your point of view, how, how do you see that in, in Latin America? I think it's definitely happening. And I don't know if we have any Colombians right here with us this afternoon and Colombians who live in Colombia, because I know, I mean, that's my main point of reference, that there is a lot happening um, in regards to, especially in music these days, uh, where people, new music artists are really looking at the roots uh, of, um, that come from the Afro-Indigenous traditions, uh, particularly looking at one region that we, we didn't look at in Colombia for a long time, and it's the Pacific coast of Colombia. And making music today, you know, really coming and, and, and um, based on, this, on these traditions of, of the Afro-Indigenous uh, peoples of, of both the Caribbean coast and the Pacific coast of Colombia. And recently I heard of a new, we have a new dance program in the, in the Caribbean coast of Colombia. And they're prioritizing uh, forms that, are, uh, that come from the African diaspora in Colombia, as well as forms that come from indigenous traditions. And that's at the core of their dance curriculum. So I think the conversation is really happening um, in Latin America. And I think it's really important for us here in the US to view and, and recognize how they're doing it over there, like in, in, in specific places in Latin America. I don't know if that, I, I mean, it's just, it's, it's, a, it's a very big question, you know. Thank, thanks so much for your answer. Yeah, and I just, you know, think that, yes, we should see more what is happening in our own countries where we are coming from. We, we can learn a lot from it. It's, it's a continuous exchange that it should happen uh, and that will benef benefit us, <laughs> you know, both sides. And yeah, thanks. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you, Diana, for the question. Gracias, Diana. Does anyone else have a question that they want to ask um, from Zoom or Facebook Live? Um, Arturo has a question. Uh, given that a lot of indigenous knowledge due to colonization probably forever, what do you think is the right approach to continue developing this indigenous knowledge. Who can do it? And is it possible to incorporate Western ideas, tools, frameworks, and still call it indigenous? Sorry, a, a word got erased uh, there. Given that a lot of indigenous knowledge has been lost <laughs> due to, yes, due to colonization. Yeah, and then the rest of the question. <laughs> Dr. Karen Mary Davalos, you want to answer that one? <laughs> My sister, is, I can see, is on the Zoom call. Um, <laughs> thank you, Edgar. I guess she doesn't want to talk. Um, I often struggle with this question as a, as a, a a Mexicana born in the United States, um, what we call pocha. And I, I struggle with, as, as what Rosanna was saying at, at the beginning, the, um, the fact that I know I was not trained in indigenous practice in terms of dancing. 
and my lens is completely Western. And then as, as an academic, I also have benefited from that Western lens and have learned how to navigate that Western lens thanks to my father who is wave dad. Daddy is um, on the, the picture that says Mary Catherine. Can you show my parents, Arturo? <laughs> there they are. My, my parents are here and uh, you saw their photo when they were 16 years old at the beginning of the chat. Um, anyway, uh, thanks to my lovely parents, uh, my radical feminist mother and my uh, Mexican academic father, uh, we were trained how to assimilate in a way that um, made it possible for us to navigate this world. And, and then on top of that, I always felt completely connected to being Mexican and Italian that I, I didn't have to be someone else. I just learned how to do both. As Rosanna was saying with, she, say it again, Rosanna for me, Chi. 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 Chi and Silvia Rivera, the Bolivian historian. Yeah. yeah. That is how my parents uh, navigated the world. And, and so we were both and all the time. And, and then uh, in my indigenous cells, the, the cells that live in my body of myself, I know that um, connecting with my ancestors through my dancing happens every time. Rosanna said this to me actually, that I, I do it without even knowing it, um, without even thinking about it when I make a dance that my indigenous self comes forward and I, I live in their world easily. And, and I feel that regularly, not only in my dancing practice, but also in my, my work as a curandera, which came from my Italian side, my great grandmother. I, may I add something, Kathy? Yes. I don't want to interrupt, okay. So, um, so Arturo, you, you start the question with, given that a lot of indigenous knowledge was lost due, col due to colonization, right? That's the first sentence in your, in yes. your question. So, um, yes, I agree, you know, uh, lost is true. However, it is, it is in our memory. So as I was saying at the very end of my presentation, this idea of having all of our ancestral knowledge, including um, the indigenous side of ourselves in the background or in our shadow, you know, like we just need to, they're present. Shadow in body, mind, centering really refers to potential that we have that has not manifested yet, but it's here with us. And mm. we have access to it. I mean, that's, that's what I believe in. And we have access to it through, through our body. That's why our work as dancers and movers um, is so important in this, in this regard. And um, as Kathy was saying with what this Bolivian historian Sylvian Rivera, what, what she says, and I mentioned this quote, when she's asked if she's indigenous and non-indigenous at the same time, her response is yes, of course. Being indigenous is a becoming, it is not an identity, it is a search. And in my opinion, when we blend all that we have, I mean, because the shadow means that, like, like what I'm proposing is that we reverse it. Let's put in the shadow, kind of like the Western ideas, mm -hmm. Um, and then let's put at the forefront our, um, the innocent body, what I like to call the innocent body. But the shadow still is here with me, right? And, and, and it shapes every experience that I live. So in that regard, when I look at all of these kind of three dimension that, that is surrounding me, then I don't need to call it indigenous anymore but it's still there. Mm. Does that make sense? I don't know if I'm making your question even more complicated. Yeah, no, no, this is, this is, <laughs> this is perfect. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, it's amazing. And I just wanna add what Silvia Rivera says. I didn't offer this quote, because uh, I find it a little bit controversial. She says, we're all Indians as colonized peoples. Decolonizing one's self is to stop being Indian and to become people. People is an interesting word, she says, because it is said in very different ways in different languages. 
<laughs> All right. Thank you. Thank you so much. Welcome. Um, anyone else have any questions or comments or reflections that they'd like to give the artists before we go into announcements as we close the evening? We have a comment from Andrina. It is so interesting that nowadays we say the shadow is the negative side of ourselves. Those things that need to be worked on changed. But now I'm learning that MVC, BMC, BMC is totally opposite, or it is <laughs> body, mind, centering. Yes, BMC is totally opposite it, as it welcomes the shadow. The shadow will always be there. It is, yeah, nice comment. It's, it's kind of uh, equivalent to the unknown, perhaps the undiscovered parts of ourselves. I could, can I say something quickly? Yes, please. Um, I just want to thank both of you for um, such a in-depth and deep um, personal and political and spiritual, if, if you will, um, presentation that that really ad addresses all that you addressed. I don't need to rename anything. And also um, positing like what is what is to come? What's the new um, way of being in the world? And how uh, into how what you were just saying, Rosana, I, I just felt so much emotion when you said it's, it's three-dimensional. We have all of this in us. We, to reclaim um, our indigenous and ancestral and also um, to do in somatics, we talk about um, take in what you need and, and let go of what you don't need and what, what is harmful or hurtful to you. And also we are creating a new um, a new way of being together. And this does have to include what we know in the body from my perspective as well. It has to come in through the body as we have been so cut off. And, um, and I agree with Rosanna that, that there is this remembering and Reverend Kyoto, um, Angel Kyoto Williams, who is a black Buddhist priest, one of the first black Buddhist priests in the United States said, we must remember because if, when we remember our bodies, when we remember the suffering, that is when we wake up and understand the suffering of all bodies in the world. And so remembering means reclaiming and understanding our humanity at all its levels and including where we are now. So we, also have new information and somatics um, is both new information and was developed in a lot of ways from Eurocentric teachers um, that have made parts of it um, difficult to absorb again in a, in a colonizing way. And in my view, somatics was the new doorway and still a new doorway into as a philosophy, my personal philosophy of somatics is, is again, like new tools, taking in um, and information from all these different lenses of all the different somatic systems and learning those lenses and language and taking in to study ourselves and humanity and letting go of what is not useful and harmful to us. So thank you for this deep, work you have both brought um, and all our teachers as you have acknowledged and all that's to become.
Thank you. Thank you, Carol Swan, for that heartfelt response. I that was actually a question that I had for Rosanna about the white dominated field of somatics and what gets trademarked and official um, because there are so many teachers that are not necessarily included in the, you know, uh, I don't know, International Somatic Movement Education and Therapy Association, for example, or, and other, you know, other kind of official um, licensed uh, so yeah, I don't know if Rosanna, you have anything to add on that or on what Carol has said, and then we'll close. Yeah, so I think it's very important to recognize that the field of somatics uh, traditionally has been, um, let's say, white dominated. Yes, that is true. However, I think it's important to, at the same time, remember that the essence of somatics doesn't relate to that. Meaning, um, just like Carol was just saying, and I was also inviting people and Liz, you two at the very beginning, it really, what somatics offers us is, is, is to be able to reclaim in our body what our birthright is as living bodies. Like I was saying earlier, like to really find avenues to to find our body of innocence. I really like this idea of finding, again, the body of innocence and what dance truly means. And somatics for me is, is that avenue and, and it doesn't really matter, but this is my opinion. It's important to recognize that yes, it is predominantly white dominated, yes. But at the same time, I think it's really important to remember that somatics goes beyond that and it calls for action that must start with the body and for political action and radical action that right now we're all responsible for that that and that action must begin with the body and that's what somatics can offer us i don't know if this this makes sense but and some people might have a different opinion and um about this idea of somatics being a predominantly a white dominated field. Mm. I think that that dance in general is predominantly in, the, in this country anyway, a white female field. And, and I think it has to do with the fact that it is of the body and possibly also uh, uh, white females were searching for some way to connect back to self. Whereas those of us coming from, um, the Latina culture, we, that's part of who we are. We, we, we come back to self, we, we allow our emotions, our sensing, feeling place to be knowledge. And in the Western ideal, that is not knowledge. Knowledge does not come from the senses, it comes from the brain. And I think that's, that, that tells me that there's a population out there wanting to know more about the self and how the self investigates or understands the world. And I think that's what the Latinx community can share into the somatics community. I know when I first started studying somatics, I felt like my experience was vastly different from the rest of the white women in the room. Because when I went back to myself and my cells, I, I had a, a deeper or a more painful experience to uncover. And then, um, and then we talked about it and we, 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 came to an understanding around, as what Rosanna was saying, that as, as we all come to our original self or our innocent self, this is what somatics has to offer. And I think the layer that Rosanna is offering as a Latina, it, it shifts for me what I started with in somatics years ago and, and, and changes then my lens around it as well. But certainly it was problematic for me in the beginning, just like modern dance in general. <laughs> Thank you so much, yes. Um. And I just wanna add one more thing, Liz, and is that there is a lot of dialogue happening right now with, with somatic practitioners worldwide about this, this idea, you know, 
about the field being predominantly white. And there is a lot of conversations happening right now. So mm -hmm. I think it's important to acknowledge that the conversation is already happening and it's a very important one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that there's some more integrating between somatic therapies and indigenous wisdom, which has been around way before the codified somatic therapies. Although, you know, I don't want to discredit the the work around trauma that has been so important, such important um, contributions. But, but yes, just uh, how do how do we integrate those? And um, yeah, there's just it's it's an interesting system where <laughs> we're dancing between and in and around. And yeah. I don't know if I'll say any more than that, but I think that it's time for us to close and we should, we should get together after the pandemic <laughs> and have more conversations like these. Thank you everyone for your, con your contribution, your presence, your intellect, your physical and spiritual presence. Thank you. And thank you Rosana Barragan and Kathy Davalos, our presenters for today. And thank you, Andreina Maldonado, our interpreter, and Arturo Mendez Reyes, our managing director. And we would also like to thank our fiscal sponsors, Dancers Group, and our funders who have made this event possible. Mil gracias a todos por un gran éxito. Thank you all for making this event a success. We cannot do it without our audience.